Heavenly Father, we love you. And as I stand before your people today, I bless them. I pray that you would shine your face upon them and you would continuously bless them beyond their imaginations and their comprehensions, Father. I know you have a tremendous plan for your people. You will never leave us and you'll never forsake us. But Father, I also know that you always warn us and you will tell your people, the prophets, the worshipers, the servants of God, you will always tell them of things that are coming because that's your nature, your good God. And we love you today, Father, and we're so grateful that we can worship you today in spirit and truth. Hide me now behind the shadow of the cross. Let Jesus get all the praise and the honor and the glory. Set a seal upon my lips that I may not say anything contrary to your word or to your will or misrepresent you in any way. We bless you and Holy Ghost, come on in and do it. What only you can do, and that is to lead us into the beautiful presence of the Lord Jesus and to his fabulous truth. In Jesus' name, everybody say amen and amen. Well, we serve an awesome God. He's doing some great things in our midst. Uh, continue to pray for the church. Continue to ask God to, to bless his people. And uh, continue to bless me and Pastor Jennifer and our family as we continue to seek the Lord's face and direction uh, for this ministry and for this region. We love this area, man. I, I love and I can't say enough about where we are. Uh, if you forget how good it is, you need to go take a ride into a big city, take a couple laps, and then come on back to Livonia in Franklin County, <laughs> amen, and realize how blessed you really are. And so we serve an awesome God. I have a very powerful message that I need to speak to the body of Christ today, that whoever would listen to me, um, I believe it's going to be a life-changing message if you allow the word to sink into your heart. And so let me speak this to you, what the Lord spoke to me early this morning. He said, the clouds of war and uncertainty are gathering across the land. The world trembles and quakes at the sound of war and great tumult. Nations are rising against nations, yet my church sleeps on. The battlefield is being prepared. Are you listening? The battlefield is being prepared. Sides are being chosen. Yet my church dreams on. This is the hour of war. There will be no peace without me, says your God. The false peace of the Antichrist and of his government is coming. Yet my church moves on from fantasy to fantasy, from fable to fable, trusting in a lie. Your land is cursed beneath your feet. Yet you deny the air you breathe is cursed, yet you reject the reality of your hour. War is coming to America. The scales have been weighed and your nation has been found wanting. Well, this is Memorial Day weekend. And as normal, I don't have a holiday message to give you necessarily. Though. The message that I will preach to you today will correspond with the hour in which we're celebrating. I do want to say to everybody here and those that are watching us in different media platforms all around the world, especially here in America, that we are so grateful for those who have shed their blood for this nation's freedom. No matter how far we fall into Babylon, we can never forget those who gave everything for us. And I'm so grateful I want to thank the veterans who are alive today who saw their brothers in combat and arms, those who were friends and family that lost lives. With them, they carry that scar forever. And with them, they sometimes die daily. And so we thank our military and we thank the families that are left behind. Just yesterday, I read that a young man from... Georgia was killed in Syria. He was uh, part of our military forces out of Georgia. I believe it was Loganville. Just a young man. And uh, just reminded of how fragile life really is. So I just wanted to start that out by saying thank you to all of our military families and to all those who have lost loved ones. No matter what war it was over the years, 
We're so grateful. And we do have a promise someday that Jesus is going to turn every weapon into a plowshare. There's coming a day when all this bloodshed will end. There's coming a day when the Prince of Peace will sit upon his throne in Jerusalem, in the new Jerusalem, in the throne of David, and he will rule the nations with an iron sepulcher. There's coming that day, amen, and what a hope that will be. Until then, there's a lot of war that's before us. The title of this message is called The War Zone. The War Zone. Again, I don't attempt to put together messages on my own. I just simply ask the Father what he's saying at the particular time, and he'll give me the word, he'll give me titles. And this morning I saw an impression in my spirit. It was not a closed vision necessarily, but it was an impression in my spirit. And I saw a group of people like a family getting together with a picnic display, and they were trying to put it all down right in the midst of a battlefield. They had their little blanket and glasses and the basket, and everything was there as armored vehicles, armored vehicles passed through the mud, and the mud would fly up, and the plates would begin to shake, but yet they were oblivious that they were placing a picnic right in the middle of a battle zone and a war zone. And immediately I knew that's the condition of today's church. Having a picnic, oblivious, totally ignorant of the reality of what's happening around them concerning warfare. And I know Psalms 23 says that he'll prepare a place for us. So he'll prepare an opportunity for us to die before our enemies. But this isn't the same understanding I received. This was ignorance because people believe it cannot happen to them. But the reality is, it's happening more than you recognize. And so based on those two prophetic things, he gave me Matthew chapter 24, and I want to minister that to you today. Is that okay? And to my critics, I am in the New Testament today. To those who don't think I understand the Bible very well, and know that there's two parts. Amen. Matthew chapter 24. I'm going to be pretty plain today as I settle into my office right here. Is that all right? I got to move some paperwork around because I'm going to be very plain, very clear today as I always try to be so that I am not misunderstood whatsoever. Amen. If you're going to get mad at me, get it mad at me for the right reason. Amen. And so I'm going to speak these things, again, with much clarity and rawness, but that is the hour we're living in when we just, we just need to hear it raw. Uh, you know, I don't like double talk. If I'm going to be somewhere where I need to hear uh, specific information, just don't beat around the bush. Tell me what the problem is. How much is it going to cost? Let me get out of here. So I'm not going to beat around the bush. The war zone. Matthew chapter 24. Let me know when you're there. Amen. And when Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and the disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. Notice that. It's still the same today that the church wants to show off the building Amen. and to show off the things that we've built for God and the things that we have for God. And verse 2, and Jesus said unto them, see you not all these things, verily, he said, I say unto you, they shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. I find that amazing because it's a correlation and a prophetic reality of today's church that we show God what we're doing here in America. We show him what we're doing through our mega ministries. We show him what we're doing through Christianity. And we say, look, God, how big our stuff is, how wonderful we are, how beautiful we've made your kingdom on this earth, how fancy our preachers are. Come on, somebody. They're Ken and they're Barbie. They're on GQ. They're perfect. 
perfect and there's nothing wrong with them. They're flawless, they're seamless and all these different trapments of life and we say, look how beautiful we're making this kingdom for you. When they forget that the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. In other words, we're not always going to look so good in warfare. Come on, Gomer Powell. You know what I'm talking about. We're not going to look so well. We're in hand-to-hand -hand combat. But the reality of the church is we want to show you how much we've achieved for you, Jesus, while you were gone. While you were absent, look at all the buildings we built. Can you imagine how many television stations we're on? Jesus, look how many books are in print with my name and my beautiful face at the bottom of the page and, and all these wonderful things but Jesus has a way of bringing us into prophetic reality and that's what my job is today is to bring you into prophetic reality he said let me just explain to you something boys do you see all this beautiful entrapment and all these things that were built he said not one stone will be left upon another. In other words, there's coming a change to the things in what you see. I love how he begins this out in the prophetic. And here's the problem we have today in church and in the realm of understanding prophecy of end times is we think that life is going to continue like it is. There'll be no pain. There'll be no troubles. That all these things are pushed for another day and another generation. I believe that we are the generation that will see these things transpire, that we will see the end time events take place. Somebody says these aren't the end days. Well, I'm going to tell you, these are your only days. These are your only days to do something great for God. In verse 3, and he sat upon the Mount of Olives. The disciples came unto him privately saying, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign? Everybody say sign. The sign of thy coming and of the end of the world. And Jesus answered and said unto them, take heed. This is the first principle that you must be aware about in the last days is that you and I are supposed to take heed. It should be an hour where you're cautious. It should be an hour where you're critical. It should be an hour where you're a student. It should be an hour where you walk very circumspectively before your God. It is an hour that you should pray before you speak. It is an hour that you should get understanding from the word of God rather than a prophet or rather than a watchman or rather than somebody on the internet or somebody on YouTube. It is an hour where you find out what thus saith the Lord is through the word of God. Taking the word and comparing the word and confirming the word. I wish I had help somewhere. But the reality is that we don't take heed as we're supposed to, but Jesus told us to be aware. Technically, that's what the word means in the Greek is to be aware. We should be more aware at this hour. We should be more sensitive in this hour. We should be more awake in this hour. We should be more critical of our politicians. We should be more critical of world agendas. We should be more critical about world affairs and match it and confirm it with the word of God. In fact, everything that is said from this pulpit, you better take to the word of God and compare it. You better take it, the word and compare and look through the lens of reality before you listen to the lips of a man. It's the word of God that will stand forever, not the words of mere mortals, not the words of men. So he said, be aware. Watch this. And Jesus answered and said unto them, take heed that no man deceive you. You need to highlight that in your Bible. No man. Let no man deceive you. Now, the word deceive there means to take away from the truth or to lead you away from the truth. So the first sign and the main sign that Jesus gives us is the reality of let no man 
lead you away from the truth. Let no man deceive you. Let no person deceive you. I don't care what position they hold, whether it's pope, priest, preacher, president. It doesn't make a difference. Senator, congressman, doesn't matter. Let no man deceive you and lead you away from the truth. That's why I'm adamant about you having a relationship with the Holy Ghost and the word of God. To where you understand what God is saying to you personally and to your family and to your life. Let no man deceive you. Be aware. Verse 5. For many, he's still talking now. For many, how many? Many shall come in my name saying I am Christ and shall deceive many. Let's look at that again because that's worth repeating. For many shall come in my name. What do you mean come in my name? Come in the name of Jesus. Come in the name of Christianity. Come in the name of righteousness. Come in the name of religion. Come in the name of the cross. Come in the name of the church. There will be many who will come in my name. This isn't just a Jim Jones. This just isn't some type of wild person out there in the wilderness. It is the reality of somebody who's a wolf in sheep clothes. For many shall come in my name and shall say or saying, I am Christ. I am anointed. I have the answer. I have the ability. I have the power. I have the solution. And I am the Christ and shall deceive many. So the first sign, again, verse 4 and verse 5 deals with deception. But watch this. It's through deception, through false saviors. Deception through false saviors. Saviors, people who say, I come in the name of Christ. I come in the name of Christianity. I come in the name of righteousness. I come in the name of the church. And I will save you from the perils and from all the wickedness of the earth. And I will change everything. And I will make a way when there seems to be no way. And I will be your answer. He said, let no man deceive you. No man can deceive you if you're aware You see, we believe it has to be somebody that is glowing and floating around per se to deceive many. No, there's many people sitting in the church today underneath a charlatan who is preaching doctrines of devils and leading them astray and leading them into the path of hell. And they have no idea that they come in the name of Christ saying that I am Christ. I am anointed. I am one of his chosen but yet they have no truth within them, and it's full of doctrines of devils. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. We know over the years there has been those, history tells us there will be those who will try to intimidate, or excuse me, to to try to be a replica of who Jesus is. But the reality is this, this applies as well to men who think that they are the saviors of the world. You look at the politicians today and you hear the speeches. I don't care where they are in the world today. They seem to have the answer for everybody. But yet their countries are in shambles. Man cannot solve the problem of sin. Militaries cannot solve the problems of sin. Money cannot solve the problems of sin. Only the blood of the lamb and only the righteousness preaching of the gospel can change the hearts and lives of people. We've been fooled again. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. He said, you're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. We know that wars have been taking place really since the time of men. The reality of Good and evil, the fighting and kingdoms and overthrows and overlords and all these different aspects of humanity in their fallen state is in a state of war. Man is in a state of war with his own being. Man can't even keep his flesh in order. No matter where he is in society. And so we're at war constantly. 
But he said there'll be wars and rumors of wars. We're standing right now on the precipice of a tremendous war in North Korea. Though there'll be those who will deny and say, no, that's not going to happen. It's just going to fade away. I am of the belief that that's not going to happen, though I hope you are right and I hope that I am wrong. I hope that we're not in the hour of major conflict, but as you watch the chessboard, the pieces are moving closer and closer towards war. The United States has just placed another aircraft carrier in the North Korean peninsula, the USS Nimitz. And that's not just one boat, that is a strike group that carries many, many boats with it. It's one of the world's largest aircraft carriers. It is now off the coast of North Korea. And somebody can say, and people have said, well, it could all change in a moment, and I agree, and I hope so. I pray that somebody blinks and everybody takes their toys and goes home. But the reality is, it doesn't look to be so. And if this was such a third-rate dictator, then why are we investing so much military power and so much money into a region? There's a reason, because there's great fear, and because this is bigger than just North Korea. And I don't have time to go into it, but I'm speaking this today to wake some folks up to realize that we are in a war zone, that all it takes is one moment, one second, and everything changes. For the first time in history, the United States is working on an interceptor type of missile system that will stop a nuclear weapon from coming to this nation. If there's no cause and no concern, then why do we have this going on right now as we speak? Because there's great cause for concern, but yet the church dreams on and acts as though everything is well. All I know is Jesus said there'll be wars and rumors of wars. And right now we're living in that in that reality. And I don't want to wake up in the morning and find out the world is on fire and I'm not ready and I don't have an answer for my family and I don't have an answer for my church. I need to be aware, don't you? We're living very close to the edge of war. Not only in America, but around the world. There's conflicts taking place as I speak all across this globe. But yet the church is asleep at the will, thinking everything is going to be fine. When I see the fruit is much different on this vine than what I'm being told. Watch this. Verse 7. This okay? Y'all right? Y'all getting good rest? Y'all need a pillow? Refreshments will be served right after the flight. Verse 7. For nation shall send each other hallmarks and flowers and candies. Let me read it again. I had the happy version. Hold on a second. For nation shall rise against nations and kingdoms against kingdoms. And there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. So Jesus shows us the first sign that deception will come through the power of false Christ, false prophets, false speakers, through the vehicle of manhood, a human. And then he goes on and speaks to us about wars and rumors of wars. And we're watching it now across our landscape and not only happening in foreign countries, but in America, we have war with our own soul. We're losing the drug war in America. We're losing the war of righteousness and pornography and so many others that I will mention here in a little while. But he said nations will rise against nations. And he laid out for us some realities of what's taking place around the world. Let me read to you, if I can, some statistics. Is that okay? Numbers don't lie. You may not like me as a messenger, but I'm going to give you some facts. This is from the UN aid chief, 
We're talking about Yemen and South Sudan, Somalia and northeastern Nigeria. Now, right now, most people shut me off in America because it doesn't deal with you and where you live. But the reality is our inner cities have become third world. The reality is a lot of children in America still go to bed hungry. We may not be at starvation, but we have a, a lot of hungry people and poor people in America. But it doesn't matter to you because it doesn't affect your 401k. UN humanitarian chief Stephen O'Brien said this. He just returned back from the field. Now, let me say this in disclaimer. The UN is not the best organization in the world. I understand that, but they're doing more than what you're doing. That was pretty good, wasn't it? They're doing more than what most churches are doing. And the statistics from other organizations add up to reality. He says, we stand at a critical time in history. More than 20 million people in four countries face starvation and famine right now. Let me try that again. Four countries face starvation and famine right now. That's 20 million people. Without collective and coordinated global efforts, people will simply starve to death. Now listen to this. He said all the regions on the brink the brink of famine have one thing in common. They are in conflict zones, war zones, if you will. We're living in a time where man would rather go to war than sit down and try to figure things out and give a little here and give a little there and stretch a border here or retract a border there. No, we're building more Borders, if you will, stretching our domain. This is part of the end time plan of the one world government and part of the end time plan that Jesus spoke about when he said kingdom will rise against kingdom, nations against nations. Are you listening to me? 20 million people are at the point of starvation and headed into famine and we sit there and we look at this reality and the church doesn't even blink an eye. We don't even flinch a muscle. We don't even really care about a statistic because what's the difference between one or one million or 20 or 20 million? It doesn't affect me. And the church is too busy trying to decide if this current president is Moses incarnate. Watch out, somebody. Then the recognize and realize the nations of the world are in desperate need for the church of Jesus Christ to stand up and do something and say something and preach this blessed gospel. Somebody's got to do something to stop this insanity. Are you here today? We are arguing about are these the days that everything's going to be well for the church? Well, listen, it may be well for you, but it isn't well for 20 million people that are about to starve to death. And we don't know anything about starvation. Just rustle your belt a little bit and try to pull it up over your hill. And the mountain and the mound that you carry. Some of y'all now, now you're mad at me. But I tried to wiggle mine and I got to loosen it one loop to get it up. Well, pastor, that's just condemning. No, my job today as a watchman is to stand upon the tower and stand upon the mountain and say, look beyond the view of your selfishness. Look beyond the view of your plastic Christianity and see the world for what it is. This is happening right now. And the church is fighting and arguing over who's what and what's going to happen. And we're going to walk in this and it's going to be just a blessed time. To be honest with you, I don't want to be in the blessed time while my brothers and sisters are starving. I'd rather give something up for them than have another day of luxury. Some of y'all never traveled outside of your neighborhood, and I have no idea what it looks like outside in the real world, but I have, and I do, and many others do. In Yemen, can we go on? This is okay. I got a lot of statistics today, so I should get you pretty mad by the time you leave, and then maybe you'll really 
realize what Memorial Day is about. It ain't nothing to do with your hot dog and your hamburgers. You're going to shove down your throat tomorrow. I'm talking to everybody watching me. It ought to be a day of mourning. It ought to be a day that we mourn to recognize. And there's nothing heroic about tomorrow. This ain't no Call of Duty video game. There are multiplied millions of families who will go to gravesides to see 19-year-old and 18-year-old and 20-year-olds who lost their lives fighting in senseless wars. And I said it, senseless. There's a, most of our wars are senseless. I won't say all because I believe you should protect. I believe you should knock a dictator upside the head with a stick. If he's trying to destroy, I understand that. I'm glad I'm not speaking German today, aren't you? Or Chinese. I thank God. But I'm going to tell you something. We got this whole thing all backwards, and there's nothing glorious about war, and we're entering in, and we are in a war zone. Let me go on. I'm about to take this jacket off, and then it's over. Yemen. Yemen. The needs of Yemen are the most critical. Now, I'm going to tie this in for all you political junkies out there. Watch this. Yemen is the most critical. It is already the largest humanitarian crisis in the world. Let me repeat myself. It is already the largest crisis in the world with two-thirds of the population or nearly 19 million people needing assistance. Now, watch. The situation in Yemen... Already the Arabs' poorest nation rapidly deteriorated as a country was plunged into war between the Iranian-backed Hithru rebels and the Saudi-backed government. Now, let me read this to you one more time. It is the largest humanitarian crisis in the world. Two-thirds of the population are nearly 19 million people needing assistance. As that is taking place in Yemen, we just made a $110 billion arms deal with Saudi Arabia. Now, hold on with me now. I'm not looking for reviews. I'm not, you know, whatever. However this thing turns out, I don't care. I'm just telling you something. So we're going to back the government who's fighting against another government and causing one of the worst humanitarian crises right now with nearly 19 million people almost at the point of starvation, and we're going to sell guns and ammos and weaponry to that nation. See, I can't go with you. I can't go with you politically. I can't go with you with false fantasies. I can't go with fables. I can only look at the word and reality on the ground. And here's the reality. People will die because of decisions that we make in this nation. People will die because of the plans of this government. People will die because of our lust for war. I like to see about $190 billion worth of wheat go over there. Well, you don't understand, and you don't understand geopolitical politics, but I understand perfectly clear of the destabilization of the entire Middle East with things like this when you have people who are dying. And folks, they're dying without Jesus. This ought to bother you. This ought to make your pom-poms be thrown into the fire or to the trash. I have no pom-poms for this hour we're living in. Now, it still has to be ratified and agreed upon by this Congress, but the point is so much fanfare is made when people don't know the other side of the coin. They don't know the other side of the geopolitical conflict. We only look what's good for us. What's good for Uncle Sam? What's good for me and for my nation? Honey, do you not realize what you sow you shall reap? What you make happen for another, it'll happen to you. I don't want starvation in my country, but it's coming. Ezekiel chapter 5, I've preached it, prophesied it, declared it, and decreed it. It's coming to America, whether you want to believe it or not. No, we only see one side. We only see one side, the side that fits us, the side that's good for us, the side that looks good. 
I'm telling you, I can't stand it. I can't stand it because we say it's all in the name of Jesus. We did all this in the name of Christ, man. We have did this, boy. We sure doing great stuff overseas in the name of Christ. Is anybody still my friend? It doesn't bother you. It doesn't bother you the statistics that I read that nearly 19 million people are needing assistance, that need food. More than 7 million people face hunger today. A staggering increase. Listen to this. More than 7 million people. People face hunger today, a staggering increase of 3 million people since January of this year. But everything's fine. Everything's great in the American church, man. I mean, we're just exploding. Ministries exploding. Book sales are exploding. Media profits are coming in. Man, we're just doing wonderful. When our watch, on our watch this year, we've already increased by 3 million people. You say, Pastor, what can be done? There's a lot that be, can be done. There's a lot that we can make happen. Prayer would be great. An accessory would be great. God, we pray for those that don't have anything. God, send the missionaries. Send those. Send money to those. As our ministry supports those that go out into the mission field. I know the Bahamas needs Jesus, but that ain't where I'm sending missionaries. Hardcore. One of the reasons for ISM as it grows and it goes on is we want to send missionaries to the four flung corners of the earth, but you ain't going to Bermuda. If they need Jesus, we'll just send the Now Network on our broadcast. Is anybody here with me? And I get so, I get so tangled in my heart and my heart gets, it's, I just can't even speak properly when I look at this world and I look at the reality of what the Great Commission was about. And we have people on one side of the political aisle and the other on the other side instead of looking at the word of God and seeing what God says and seeing how he sees it. We are a corrupt people and we're causing bloodshed around the world. I'm not a peacenik. I'm not a pacifist. I've told you this before, come on over late at night one night and try to open that door and find out who meets you. If Jesus don't respond immediately, Colt will. Now some people are like, eh, eh, eh. I'll ask you if you're saved first. I'm not going to shoot you first. I'm going to ask you if you're saved. <laughs> And then do you need assistance? But the reality is, listen, in Yemen, 19 million people are needing assistance. We're on the other side of the coin funding a particular government. And I understand all of that, and you got to balance it. But the point is this. We are in a crisis, and we're more interested in helping that than solving the problem. Most Americans don't know this, and I had to dig to find this report that I'm fixing to read to you. I didn't even know it was there. Not only was there the $110 billion agreement, there was a pledge to sell 150 Lockheed Martin Apache helicopters to the Saudi Arabian government at the tune of $6 billion. Now watch this now. It's going to bring 450 jobs. To Saudi Arabia. Is anybody here with me at all? I just feel like I'm all alone on this weekend. That's okay. Been here before. I didn't even know that was in the deal. How many of y'all knew that was in the deal? I had to dig and find it because it was hidden underneath the manure. So who's that going to profit? The military industrial complex for simple and short Mick or Mock. However you want to pronounce it, the reality is this, is that this is a whole smoke and mirrors. It's a whole shambles of deception and the church gobbles it down because it's done in the name of Christ, in the name of Christianity, in the name of a church, in the name of the kingdom, when reality it's deception. 
and we support it. And we parade it. We carry it. Yay! I don't want that blood on my hands. God, forgive us. Forgive us for what we're going to do. Forgive us for what's going to take place. Had no idea. Six billion dollars. And there's something else I can say about Lockheed, but I can't right now. I know something they're fixing to do. They're fixing to acquire. They're fixing to get larger than they are right now. Well, I imagine so if six billion dollars go through. South Sudan. More than 7.5 million people need humanitarian assistance. That's up 1.4 million from last year. More than 1 million children are believed to be actually malnourished, excuse me, acutely uh, malnourished. O'Brien warned that 270,000 of them face imminent risk of death if assistance is not there. Somalia, I don't have time to read that. Northern, northeastern Nigeria. I've been to Nigeria. All these things. You say, Pastor, why does it matter? It matters because it's the whole view of the world. It's the Christian view. We can't have the American view. We cannot look at it as a political view. We cannot look at a Republican, Independent, Democrat. We have to look at it as a world view, a Christ view, a kingdom view. How does Jesus see it? He said there'll be wars and rumors of wars, nation against nations. There'll be pestilence. There'll be famine. There'll be earthquakes. Can I tell you something? It's been going on. Has it stopped? Where is your mindset today when you think we're in a reprieve? Where is your mindset when you think it's all going to be restored by a man or a woman or a particular entity? Where is your mindset when all of these things have taken place over the centuries from the day that Jesus spoke it forth? And all of a sudden, we happen to be the lucky charm generation. We happen to be the one generation that all of a sudden, in the depth of our sin, we get righteous overnight and all is well. It's a fairy tale. It's a fable and it's deception. And I refuse to go along with it. And I will preach this message until the coming of the Lord. Because I have no other mandate. I have no other message. The gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the gospel. This is what Jesus said. Boy, I got a lot to say, and I'm just trying to be real cool in this Catholic church. Is anybody awake? Famine. Plagues. He said pestilence. Talking about plagues. We've had plagues for, this, for centuries. We forget how easy and how fast it could take place. 75 million people were killed in a two-year period of 1918 to 1920 just by the flu. Well, we've come a long way. And all, you can't even stop sniffling. All the cold remedy, everything that's on the wall at Walmart won't stop you. From getting the flu or, or anything. None of that blocks it. It only helps you get through. All you're doing with NyQuil is just getting drunk so you can go to bed. <laughs> Wave at me. Sanctified whiskey for the church. Was that two quarts or two pints? Still get up sneezing and sniffing, but boy, what a great night's sleep I had. <laughs> Some of y'all didn't do NyQuil. You just hit the old moonshine. I don't know. Hmm? Ebola is up 800% already this year. For the first time in history, India has reported the Zika virus. See, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because we're in America, man. We, it doesn't matter. It, that's over there. It don't matter about our brothers and sisters, man. It ain't got nothing to do with us. No, we just got STDs. What is that? You look it up. Can't find drugs to even take care of some of the simple things that used to happen to folk. 
NyQuil is not going to help you on that, Jack. Hmm? But no, because we don't see you in trucks driving around and tents and people with masks and all these different things and lines outside of pharmacies and all the, we, we think we're just fine and we're cool, man, and, and everything's just wonderful. When America, if the realization was to be exposed, we are a nation that's sick and broke. We just have enough plastic commercialization to cover it up and make us look good. We just got enough clothes in the, in the closet to make it through. Seventy-five million people. I, I couldn't even get the full statistics of how many people have died over the centuries, over time periods of all the plagues. But the reality is, has the plagues ever stopped? In America, we're seeing polo and different types of various diseases make a comeback. And I know people say, well, it's a political reason because of this or that. No, it's a sin reason. It's a curse reason. I understand all that stuff, but, but the reality is it's sin. And Jesus said it would be part of the last days. And then he said earthquakes. What did he say? There'll be earthquakes in diverse places. Listen to this. In the last 24 hours, 113 earthquakes took place in, America, in the world. Probably more since we, we've been in here on broadcast. We've been together in service. A few hours ago in western Turkey, a 4.6 earthquake took place. Now listen, what I'm trying to tell you, I'm not saying people just dying everywhere and there's, a, there's cataclysmic chaos going everywhere. But these are the things that Jesus said would take place and the birth pangs are upon us. In the last two weeks, 780 earthquakes took place. Well, I didn't feel it. Well, then I guess everything's fine then if you didn't feel it. You know I'm telling you the truth. That is the mindset of America because it didn't rock our cradle or rock our boat. We okay. And that's the wrong attitude to have. The church should, never, the church should feel the pain of our brothers and sisters in Sudan. The church should feel the pain of those that are suffering persecution around the world. Verse 8. Are you still here? Somebody wrote to me one time and said, every time you say that on film, on the broadcast, I'm saying, yes, I'm still here. <laughs> so to that person who contacted me, I'm glad you're with me. All, how much is all? All is all that all will ever be. All these are the beginning of sorrows, birth pangs, woman about to go into labor, about to give that baby. Every woman that's ever had a baby, you don't say, oh, wait, 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 wait. I got some laundry to do. Wait, 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 wait. I'm going to go mow the yard. When Joshua came in the world about 11 hours before <laughs> Jennifer gave birth, Pastor Jennifer gave birth to him, I said, no, because I love my sleep. It was about 12, 11 or 12 o'clock at night. She said, honey, it's time. I said, no, 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 no. You couldn't put the water back. You couldn't change anything. You could. You know what I was doing? I was driving to the hospital. Everybody knows what I'm talking about. If you ever had a baby, been around a baby, or know somebody has a baby, you can't stop the birth pains. When the birth pains begin, that means it's time for travail. It's time for the giving birth of the baby. And I believe we're at that point of giving birth to this thing. So how could we be so arrogant and so ignorant and so high-minded to think, oh, this is a special session and a special season. Go ahead, put it all back in. You, it can't happen now. I found out the hard way. Boop, there was Joshua. And there he is now, 12 years. Amen. Watch this. And then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted 
and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Now remember, this don't include you, okay, because you're a Christian in America. No, 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 you, you don't understand. You have special privileges. You have special rites of passage. Uh, if you went right now over to a foreign Muslim country and you ran around saying, in Jesus is Lord, they won't touch you. No, 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 you're special. You're, you're going to be special whenever they come and attack our churches here in America. They're not going to bother you. Well, first of all, they're going to have to get through our angels with swords of fire. But the reality is this. We are arrogant and ignorant to think that we're not included in this. And I don't have time to teach eschatology about people saying this was all towards the Jews. It is not. There is more understanding to this. But you have to go listen to my revelation teaching to hear that. I ain't got time for it. Nor would I waste my time. Watch this. Verse 9. Then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall... Does that say kiss you or kill you? Oh, kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. I want to give you some more statistics so you can enjoy your hot dog tomorrow. Nearly 250 million Christians face high persecution. That's what they call, they call high persecution. Between 2005 and 2015, this is the latest statistics I can find. I know the numbers are much higher now. Over 900,000 Christians were killed. That's 90,000 a year. Just a number. Don't worry about it. Enjoy your meal. Nearly a million Christians in 10 years were killed. And I think that statistic is low, and it would be much higher. Just the other day, you all know this, in Egypt, in Minya, Egypt, there was a Catholic Christians who were headed to a monastery, and they were driving in the caravan, and some terrorists pulled them over in three or four different vehicles, got out in military uniforms with masks upon their face, and shot them all dead. I believe there was nine of them were little children. I preached in that city, in Minya, Egypt. I preached the an open air, air crusade there. And to me, that hits home. Maybe there were some that were within that crusade. I don't know. But what's the point? The point is, that's our brothers and our sisters. That's, that's our family. And people will say in the American church, well, they were Coptic, and they don't, they don't worship the way we do, and, and they don't act the way we do. They name the name of Jesus. They may not have a full understanding of the way that we worship, but if they name the name of Jesus, they're my family too. And if you don't like that, then you ought to mourn for the nine Christian children. Here they were just going to be a part of a church. Listen, it's like us going and renting a van and going on a church retreat and somebody pulling us over and massacring everybody in the bus. 59 were injured, 29 were killed. Jesus said, you're going to be delivered and you're going to be killed for my name's sake. Let me ask you, has it stopped in the world today? No, they're slaughtering Christians daily. And now ISIS has a new tactic and it's against the children. They already did it over in Syria and northern parts of Iraq, but we're starting to see it now in Europe and in Egypt. I'm sorry if this is too raw and plain for you and ruined your little idol of worship of a government and of a president, but I don't worship man and I don't worship entities. I pray for them and I ask God to use them, but the reality is they don't trump the word of God. They don't trump the reality of what's going on on the ground, and I won't stick my head in the ground and act like nothing's happening to the world around me. Do we even mourn anymore? We're so numb. It is not because the church is callous. I believe we're just so inundated. Some are callous and some are lazy and some don't give a rip. 
But the reality is we're so inundated. So much is happening at us. So much is coming at us. So much is like a light, a, a flash of light. Can you not see what Jesus said? If you don't believe me and my words, believe the words in red. Jesus said, they're going to deliver you up and they're going to kill you. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. I believe betrayal's in the church right now and there's more betrayal that's going to come. The true character of any man or woman is only found out in a time of adversity. I don't know who you are until pressure comes to you. You don't know who I am until I've been pressurized. Can I get a witness? Because we look so cute in church. Let's get out in the marketplace where it gets a little rough and tough and let's see who you really are. Ah, I thought I had some friends. They just walked out the door. Let me finish. I know you got stuff to do. You got to go home. And many false prophets, verse 11, shall rise and shall deceive many false prophets, people that prophesy and they bring people away from the truth. False prophets, they fill the landscape of America today. Verse 12, and because iniquity, everybody say iniquity. This is the stain of sin. This is the depth of sin. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall grow cold. The love of God, the agape, he's talking about church. He's talking about those that don't even have the love of God. It begins to wane. We're watching that take place in America, the waning of our love for humanity. It was just recently released, and some of y'all may know of this, about a Planned Parenthood video where they talked with this director and found out that they were laughing during the time of decapitation of aborted baby and laughed when the eyeball rolled into her lap. Make America great again. Sorry, I can't go with you. Defund it all. Not just a little piece in, in the Obamacare that ain't going to matter nothing that hasn't even been approved yet. Strike it all out and arrest every one of them. Then you're going to make America great. Then I'm on your side, bub. But until you do righteousness, I'm going to preach this thing as hard and as loud and as far as I possibly can. Because that's what's sending America into the abyss right there. That you can allow these people to be tax funded and they laugh about decapitating a baby's head and an eyeball rolling out. It don't, it don't bother Americans. It don't bother the American church. No, we're going to leave here. We're going to go eat. You know, we're going to do our thing. I'm not condemning anybody. I'm not talking down to the church. I'm just saying, where's the heartbreak? Where's the outcry? No, we're, we're dazzled by tweets. We're dazzled by leaks. We're dazzled by all types of schisms and all types of stuff. That is just the shadow of a hand playing you. It's all by design. All heroes are supposed to be embattled. Have you not read Marvel comics lately? Have you not remember comics? Don't you remember the heroes always supposed to go through struggles and you support the hero and, oh, we're going to be there. And everybody gets worked up when the reality is what I'm telling you. It's on the ground. Here it is. Who's leaking what? How about who's leaking their life out right now as we speak and dying? In America, we have an opium problem. We have a heroin problem. And by the way, by the, way the greatest harvest of opium is in Afghanistan, second to Miramar. And guess who's protected it? Guess who died for it? Guess who will mourn for it tomorrow? Those protecting the opium crop and the route that goes through Southeast Asia, 
Oh, I mean, people, people just, they, they don't want to hear this. They, they don't want to hear any of the realities of, of what's going on. They just want to support their candidate. They want to take their little statue and walk around and say, this is my idol. This idol is going to make everything new. This idol right here is going to make everything great. This is my idol. In my idol, I trust. I don't have an idol. I have a savior. I have a savior who didn't give a speech. He gave his life. And he pinned it in blood. And he put an indelible mark upon the church for centuries and for years and years and years. This word has never changed. You better understand eschatology and the end times before you worried about the prophetic of other people. Ding. Good answer. If you all didn't hear that, somebody's phone just dinged. I got another hour, so you might as well just get comfortable. Kick your shoes off. Watch this. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. So we have this weaning or this, this, this waning of love. We're, we're losing our love for our fellow countrymen, for our neighbors, for people that we love, for people that are around us. The drug addiction is so high, as I was saying before, about heroin that in a town in Ohio, they had to order more coolers to put the dead bodies. The mortuary was too small. Y'all ain't getting this. Hello, Sam's. Do you have a large cooler truck for people doing opiums? And we're not talking about street people. We're talking about professional people. In one place, the drug problem is so bad that they had to arrest the mortuary workers because they were cutting open the dead bodies to get the drug out of their stomach. Y'all, y'all ain't here with me today. Boy, I'm not going to be the most favored this week. I don't care. I don't care because your preachers won't preach it. You got to go to the back alley of the church called YouTube to find this. They don't let people like me in the front. They let people like you. They're sophisticated. Hey, you're with me. You're in trouble anyways, Ignited. Don't tell anybody to go here. But, but come, come on. Why, why, why do we have to talk this way? We talk this way to shake people up and wake them up and say, please get out of your dreamland. Please. For the sake of intercessory prayer, for the sake of the children, for the sake of fighting this good fight of faith and believing for a mighty revival, pray instead of putting your trust in people. I'm closing sometime. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Last week I told you about stars. And showing the homosexual program. How many of y'all remember that sermon? That'd be one of your top ten of this year. It's got a lot of traction. How many of y'all cut your cable bill? Don't look at me. Don't, don't look at me if you cut off. But I got another one for you. HBO. that will hit home to some of y'all in this place. HBO just released a program where they had over 200 people in an orgy scene. on a ferry boat in Australia. And it was just released, by the way, it's called The Leftovers. Made me want to puke. There's your leftover. Woo-wee! What a day we're living, boy. I'm sure them people in down in World War II were thinking about an orgy when they were fighting and losing their life. How sacrilegious. I'm sure them people in WW1 giving their lives in the trenches were thinking about gay marriage and the insanity of the abyss we call America. No, I don't think so. Two hundred with all the scenes. How many of y'all gonna keep your cable on? 
That's up to you. But I would snip, clip, and get rid of it. Come to the world of rabbit ears with me. For this is where I live. Me and Thumper. Thumper's a good guy. Thumper ain't going to hell. I was talking to somebody. I'm going to close with this here. I got two more scriptures and I'm out of your way. But I was talking to somebody who works in the private security. And they were telling me about some incident reports that they were reading. And this one particular mall in an area that is affluent at least portions of it. They have teenagers that are going inside, I won't even mention the bookstore, but going inside the bookstore and peeing, urinating all over the books. If that were 30, 40 years ago, huh? Huh? So how are you legislating righteousness? You can't. You can't legislate righteousness. You cannot. You can put laws and say don't urinate on the book, but you can't change the devil that's inside that child unless you lay hands on it and say, come out in Jesus' name and put the gospel in their heart. See, I always get the good messages for holidays. This brother also told me that in the children's zone, children's zone, man, that's where the children are safe, right? Had an old man walk up and expose himself to the youngins. But everything's fine in America. Verse 13. But he that shall endure, please say endure. That means it's a conflict. That my, my means my Bible tells me it's not going to be primroses. It's not going to be a beautiful thing. It's not going to be a cakewalk. I have to endure. The word in the Greek means to remain. I got to be remain at my post. I got to remain at my station. Why did he tell me I'm going to have to remain? Because there's going to be a desire to flee. There's going to be so much craziness and so much war going on. I may not want to stay in my bunker. I may not want to stay in my position. Because I'm going to tell you something, there's many people who are going to flee the cross and flee the church and flee Christ when it all comes down because you couldn't find nobody to prepare you for what's coming down. You ain't going to say that to me. I risk you being upset with me. But I would rather have that than to say that I denied the faith and denied you the proper training. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be what? Saved. Sozo. Means sound, secure, rescued. I'm enduring. I ain't getting off this post. I'm not getting off this truth. I'm not stopping preparing my house or this church. I'm still preparing. I will continue to prepare. I don't care if Mickey Mouse is in the White House tomorrow when I wake up. I don't care who's there. This is the word of God. Let me go. Verse 14. I'm going to get out of here. Some of y'all just so mean looking. And, and this gospel, excuse me, what gospel is he talking about? That gospel right there. Everything he just said is part of the gospel. You can't cheat. You can't. Choose and pick what you want out of the word and make your own doctrine out of it. Especially eschatology, because eschatology is what it is. Now watch. And the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached only in America because we're the only ones worthy. <laughs> Trying to see everybody. All the world, Who? All, All the world. So you think Yemen should hear the gospel? I think Yemen should hear the gospel too. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness unto all nations. And then, then, then shall the end come. Say, Pastor, when's the end going to come? As soon as we get done preaching this thing. Didn't say it was tomorrow. Never said it was tomorrow. Never said it was next week. But we're having a baby. The world's having a baby. And it's going to hurt. It's going to be messy. There ain't nothing sterile about it. 
There ain't nothing pretty about it. We're in a war zone. You need to pick up your picnic basket, go put it back in your little pantry, reach down there and grab your sword, the full armor of God, and get ready to go into this war zone that we're in. If you don't have this mindset, you may not survive what's coming in the coming days. Heavenly Father, I delivered your message, and I know it's very difficult on this Memorial Day weekend. But we're in a war zone. That's what you told me, and that's what I believe, and that's what your word declares. I pray for my brothers and sisters around the world today in Yemen, in Egypt, in Sudan, Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, and Iran, and Iraq, and Syria, Turkey, throughout the four flung corners of the earth. And I pray for my brothers and sisters, first of all, that you would strengthen them with faith. And that, Father, you would give pastors who are under persecution and threat of death almost daily, would you give them the strength to stand up? And, Father, may we as the church in America, may we respond with kindness through intercessory prayer and different avenues of ministries that are out there on the front line right now. Would you continue to give me wisdom to find new ministries to sow into so that we can have our part you said that you were in jail and nobody visited you. You said that you were naked and nobody clothed you. You were hungry and nobody fed you. Lord, I don't want to be a part of that group who didn't do something for you. Father, help us. Everybody listening to the sound of my voice, you have an obligation and assignment to intercede for the nations of the world. Father, help us to build this hospital, this international hospital right here on the grounds of Ignited Church to send the gospel to the nations of the earth. Lord, we love you. We pray for America. We pray for this president. We pray for this Congress. We pray for our military. We pray that all would bend the knee, bow the heart, and confess with the tongue that Jesus is Lord. Father, bless your people today. Surround those who have lost loved ones in the wars of past and present. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.